Well, thank you very much. Let me see if I can get this on. I should say, if you are not where you can see the screen, you should try to be. Because um, uh, this is going to be, there's a lot of images here. I, I'm starting here with a, with a photograph, a Jeff Wall photograph, rather than a pretty picture of the brain, because you're going to have plenty of pretty pictures of the brain. Um, I'm going to let that one speak for itself. I think this is a great photograph. But um, so I should start by saying, for any area of science where you're wondering how a particular body of scientific knowledge bears on legal questions, there's two issues. There's first a question of relevance. Does, the, does what science tells us speak to the question of, what, of how these various legally important questions should be answered? Is it even relevant? And then there's a question of, if it is relevant, how should we use the information? And there are lots of cases in which we recognize that it's relevant, but we don't think we should use the information, or we ought to have severe constraints on how we use the information. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the relevance of neuroscience to criminal responsibility judgments. Um, and I'm not talking at all about how we should use the information if it turns out to be relevant. Um, and I think it's actually quite a complicated and subtle question. So, but what I'm going to try to explain is that there's piles and piles of neuroscientific studies that are very, very suggestive, but which actually really are not of importance to understanding criminal, res criminal responsibility. They just don't bear on the question of whether a particular defendant is criminally responsible, although they appear to at first glance. And then I'm going to try to suggest that the, so I'm going to try to clear a lot of ground. And then I'm going to try to suggest at the end, um, I'm going to give you an example of an experiment which is not, does not bear itself immediately on the question of criminal responsibility, but which points the way towards work in neuroscience that might. Um, let me start with a story. So this was reported in the, uh, the archives of neurology in 2003. Um, here's what happens. As a man in Virginia, he's 40 years old. Um, he lives with his, with his wife and her 12-year-old stepdaughter, his 12-year-old stepdaughter, her daughter from previous marriage. And he develops an interest in uh, child pornography at the age of 40, which is quite puzzling to him. He's never had this interest before. Um, he starts to collect child pornography, and then he finds himself increasingly attracted to his 12-year-old stepdaughter. Until one day he makes significant efforts to have sex with her, and he's caught by his wife, who is <laughs> understandably horrified. She runs to the police. They arrest him. He's convicted of child molestation. And the judge gives him, as is common, he gives him an option of either doing jail time or going into a treatment program. And he, um, he opts for the treatment program out of a desire to avoid jail time. Um, he's doing exceedingly poorly in the treatment program. Um, among other things, he's coming on to staff in the program. He's coming on to other patients in the program. He's not doing well in the program. In addition, he's suffering from severe headaches during the program. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> and they, uh, so they give him an MRI. And what do they get? They get this, which you really don't need to be a doctor to see that you don't want your brain to look like this. He's got a, uh, he's got a giant, giant tumor behind his left eye, an orbitofrontal tumor. Now, um, my god, they say, they immediately put him under the knife. They remove this tumor. Um, he recovers from the, from the surgery. And lo and behold, he really has no interest any longer in child pornography, has no interest in children. Um, Interesting. He then goes through, the, goes through the rest of the treatment program with flying colors. They send him home. Um, his wife, not surprisingly, doesn't say, oh, honey, I'm so glad you're back. She leaves him. Um, several months later, he starts to develop an interest in child pornography again. Um, disturbed by this, he runs back to his doctors. They give him another fMRI, another MRI. What do they see? The, the tumor is returned. They remove the tumor again. The urges go away again. Okay, and then, as from what I, from what I, the last I heard about this case was a couple of years ago. But from what I understand, the guy is living comfortably now and doesn't have any particular problems. Now, what this case 
is an example of, is a, it's an extremely vivid example of something which we've known for a very long time, which is that um, the prefrontal cortex, the front of your brain, it plays a really crucial role in regulation of a huge amount of different kinds of behavior. And if you have a mucked up prefrontal cortex, there's a pretty good chance you're going to act pretty badly. This is something that we've known for a long time from lots of different studies. This is just a particularly vivid example. Now, this kind of body of literature about the prefrontal cortex, of which this is just one example, has led several biologists to say remarkable things. Here's a quote from, uh, from David Eagleman, um, who had the misfortune of putting that photograph of himself on the internet. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, <laughs> Eagleman, Eagleman wrote, this is just from the Atlantic Monthly quite recently. Some of you may have seen this. He wrote, it really just reflecting on work about the prefrontal cortex. He wrote, it no longer makes sense to ask to what extent was it his biology and to what extent was it him, because we now understand that there's no meaningful distinction between a person's biology and his decision making. They're inseparable. While our current style of punishment rests on a bedrock of personal volition and blame, our modern understanding of the brain suggests a different approach. Blameworthiness should be removed from the legal argo. I include also pictures here of two other biologists um, who've said similar things. Um, there's a real kind of trust me, I'm a scientist kind of thing going on here. But what should we say to, in response to this? What they're suggesting is that what is anyway a common, in fact, a crucial understanding of criminal responsibility should be abandoned fundamentally, it should be abandoned. And they think that neuroscience shows this to us. Um, a first, there's, there's several, as I see it, there's several errors going on in this remark of Eagleman's. Um, one of them is the, the kind of obvious point that explaining isn't the same as explaining away. That, and you can see this by thinking about the case of praise. So for instance, you might think somebody who, what does he do? He hits a home run in the bottom of the ninth. He wins the game. And this is something which we think of as worthy of praise. And we also recognize that there's going to be a whole variety of biological factors that went into this. Um, he had more fast twitch fibers in his arms. He, uh, showed grace under pressure, which was attributable to a variety of neurological facts about him. He didn't have such, he didn't have the kind of massive amygdala response that I would have if a fastball came flying at my head, for instance. And these are things that we, we recognize that the biological explanation is in no way undermines the normative explanation, the explanation through which we would say he's praiseworthy for his behavior. And so why should we think blame is any different? That's a kind of first point. Um, here's the real point. The real point is, the physiological facts don't matter until you're able to explain what normatively relevant facts, facts that are independently of significance to criminal responsibility, we learn from the physiological facts are present or absent. So for instance, in this case, there's a variety of interesting features about this man. He's in a certain way alienated from his impulses. He finds them puzzling. That might be significant. Maybe it isn't. But we could at least argue about whether this is a significant fact which should tell us, ah, we shouldn't hold him fully criminally responsible for his behavior. <laughs> um, some other examples, he's fixable, right? Uh, instead of most of the people in his treatment program, it's one major battle for them to get out of that treatment program and, be, and to stop having interests in sexual interests in children. But him, you know, you put him under the knife and you get the job done, right? Now, maybe that's of relevance, too. In fact, right, the judge in that case seems to have thought it was relevant from the get-go. They gave him the option of the treatment program as opposed to punishment <laughs> prior to even the recognition that he had this tumor. Um, so we can argue about whether or not the fixability of it is normatively relevant. Um, another example, right? He fails the, the so-called policeman at the elbow test, which is a pretty, pretty poor test of control. Um, I mean, anyone who kills a policeman fails that test too. But, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's, <laughs> you might think it's, it's in some way relevant that he fails this test, right? There he is in the treatment program, knowing full well that if he fails out of the treatment program, he's going to jail. That seems significant. And it seems explicable to us that he should fail that test in light of the biological facts. But it's not the biological facts that matter. It's the normative facts, which seem to be undergirded by the biological facts. And further, the opposite normative facts, normatively relevant facts, are also going to have a biological basis. Someone who's not alienated from their impulses, who fully embraces their impulses, is also, there's going to be a biological explanation in theory for that fact. So it's not the biology that matters all by itself, as someone like Eagleman seems to think. So this is to say, 
here's how I think about this subject. I think you cannot take shortcuts. If you want to know what neuroscience's relevance is to criminal responsibility, you need to look at each individual neuroscientific experiment and figure out, have we learned something from the physiological and biological facts that tells us something about the normatively relevant facts? Or have we not? And you cannot simply note, we depend on our brains, our brains undergird lots of stuff, and, meet, and reach any conclusions from that at all. You have to know what facts about us are undergirded by various neurological features. OK, so here's two questions then to ask. And I ask them because people have thought that the answer to the first anyway of these is decidedly yes. And I think it's a decided no. So one thing is you might think, are there neuroscientific results today that we can point to which show us that we ought never to be assigning criminal responsibility? Is there, can we, are we discovering facts about the brain such that in light of those facts, we know that people actually fail to satisfy some necessary condition for blameworthiness across the board? That's the first question. A second question is, even if that first question, if the answer to that first question is no, you might think, nonetheless, neuroscientific results might help us to assign criminal responsibility more accurately in particular instances. Perhaps it teaches us something about the, about the facts about people which are relevant to responsibility assessments that we didn't know in the absence of those neuroscientific results. Okay? And I think the answer to that second question is, is a qualified yes. I don't think that there have been, I don't know of any experiments yet that help us to do this. But I think that, and I'm going to try to suggest by the end, that there might be ways in which we could design experiments that do. OK. So first on this point about, are, do, we, do we in fact lack some crucial feature for, that's necessary for responsibility across the board? Do we learn that from neuroscientific results? So here's an experiment. Um, I should say, actually, before I talk you through this one. So some of you may know the um, Benjamin Labette's experiments from the 1980s. Um, uh, we can t I'd be happy to talk about those. Those, those were experiments that used EEG, um, so sensing electric activity, electrical activity at the scalp. And um, they have many, many methodological problems, which people have criticized them for over the years. Um, what Blobet's experiment seemed to indicate, however, was that you had that there was neurological activity, activity in the brain, which predicted when people were going to make particular choices, and that at times at which they would not have seen those choices as having been settled yet. Um, but the methodological problems that are, are serious in the Libet experiments. And some of those methodological problems have been overridden by um, some new work, which, where you get a similar and important, a similar, very similar result, really the same result, but with some important differences. But, so here's what they did. This is um, the kind of crucial author here is John Dylan Haynes. Haynes is a pretty important neuroscientist in this area. Here's what they did. So they're scanning subjects with fMRI. And the subject is seeing a series of computer screens while they are scanned. And they have a button in their right hand and a button in their left. And on each screen, you get a letter of the alphabet. It's there for half a second. And the subject is instructed to whenever they like to press a button. Then it can either be the left button or the right button. And then after they press a button, a screen appears that gives them some options about what letter was on the screen, not when they pressed the button, but when they decided to press the button. So they're asked to reflect back and ask, when did you, when did you make the decision to press? And we, so, we know, we, so, they, so the experimenters know a series of things. They know the sequence of letters. They know when the button was, in fact, pressed. And they know what the subject believed was, the, was on the screen at the time that they pressed the button. OK? Here's what you get. Haynes and Soon and so on, they find that there's a particular part of the brain It's actually radically different from the one that was identified by Labette, which his was in the motor cortex, but where they're able to predict with 60% accuracy that the person is going to make the choice that they make and when they're going to make it. And they're able to do this, if you look at this number here, eight seconds in advance. Okay? So you can imagine if you were, so you know the game matching pennies. Um, here's how it works. Uh, I'm going to choose heads or tails, and you're going to choose heads or tails, and we're going to reveal our choice at the same time. And if, if we both get heads, I win. And if we get a head and a tail, you win. Or if we both get tails. If we have the same things, I win. If we have different things, you win. Now, you'd, you'd win against these subjects if you have the fMRI data much more often than you'd lose. Because eight seconds in advance, you know he's going to go left or he's going to go right. 
So you just choose whichever is going to work for you to maximize your chances of winning. Okay? Now, um, so the, the crucial thing here is that, so another way to think of it is, for, for, eight, for something like eight seconds, the subject believes, I have yet to make up my mind. And then, I've made up my mind. But in fact, on the basis of brain data, it seems that they're able to suggest that, oh, no, no, you're, you made up your mind a lot earlier. This is to put the result in the most intuitively disturbing way. <laughs> so what a lot of people have felt is that there is, that there's something about this physiological course, this course of physiological events, which is really out of whack with their ordinary conception of what they do when they act, when they act voluntarily. And this has made people think in perfectly ordinary circumstances in which I think things are a certain way when I act voluntarily. They're radically different and maybe different in some way which undermines the appropriateness of criminal responsibility. Now, so that is, here's the ordinary kind of picture which I think is underlying this. So here's your head. Here is the thought inside your head. When you have a volition, when you make a decision, what you do is you represent a particular future action. And then, lo and behold, this is a really interesting little thought that you have, this picture of the future, because it makes the future as it represents it to be. That is, you think, I'll move my hand, and boom, the hand moves in the way that it was represented as moving by the thought. Okay? This is the ordinary kind of sense, at least my ordinary sense. And then you might think, and I think that this, these, both of these conditions are a little more subtle, or whether this is really part of every ordinary picture of voluntary action, but I think a lot of people think, look, here's what happens. There, it, this particular mental event, this volition, has two really important properties. The first is it's conscious. It's me deciding. And the second is that it settles what I'm going to do. Prior to that mental state, it's not, set, it's not settled. It's up in the air what I'm going to do. <laughs> and then I have the thought, and boom, now it's settled what I'm going to do. Okay? And the thought is somehow or another, this ordinary picture of voluntary action is being challenged by the results of the experiment. Incidentally, just you know, because we're doing law here, aren't we? Um, that here's the model penal code's uh, model penal code's account of the voluntary act requirement to criminal law, which where I want to emphasize this conscious. The voluntary, the, basically, the model penal code identifies two forms of voluntary bodily movement: the habitual and the conscious. And it says if you don't have one or the other of these, you don't have criminal liability. Okay? So if, in fact, this ordinary conception of voluntary action is really challenged by these experiments, you might think we need to respond in some way. right? We either need to rethink this voluntary act requirement, because, in fact, people's conduct isn't really voluntary in the way in which we thought. Or we need to just recognize, hey, you need to have your actions be voluntary in this way in order to be criminally responsible. So nobody is. Okay? Now, but that's only if, in fact, this ordinary intuitive picture of voluntary action is truly challenged. Why should you think it's truly challenged? So here's a question. So did the subjects of these experiments act voluntarily in that ordinary sense? The argument for thinking that they didn't is this. You've got, you've got really three events of importance. You've got, a, you've got this, the time of predictive neural activity, where you're able to predict what the person is going to do with 60% accuracy. You've got a later time at which they say, that's when I made the choice. And then you've got the bodily motion, flipping of the, the pushing of the button in this case. And the intuitive thought that the ordinary picture is being challenged here is to say, this predictive neural activity, this settles what I'm going to do. But whatever's going on then, it's not conscious. This event is conscious, but it's not what settles what I'm going to do. That was already settled before I even got there. That was the thought. Okay. Now, I should say, this second claim, I think, is highly is, you know, should be rejected. It's perfectly possible for one event to settle what you're going to do, and then for a later event to settle what you're going to do, too. I mean, this happens all the time. Um, a friend of mine tells a story. He was once on a law faculty with somebody who was in the Coolidge administration. All you ever had to do to get the guy to tell this story, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, so he's old. So the, uh, all you ever had to do to get him to tell the story of his time in the Coolidge administration was to mention Calvin Coolidge. And then a few seconds later, the guy would tell you the story about, Calvin, about how he was in the Coolidge administration. What you have there, right, is an earlier event which settles that this guy's going to tell you the story. <laughs> right? 
And then the late, but that doesn't mean that telling the story isn't voluntary action. Of course it's voluntary action. He later makes the decision to tell the story and tells it. So, so, th so this second claim is, is the fact that this event settles what you're going to do doesn't mean the later one doesn't settle what you're going to do. But, but even if we grant it, let's grant that this later event settle does not settle what you're going to do. If that's settled here, this is still not enough to show, this is still a bad argument for thinking that we're in conflict with the ordinary picture. Here's why. Well, so just as you can have the thought about your hand, you can have the thought about the thought about your hand. Right? You can think, I just made the decision to move my hand, which is not the same as making the decision to move your hand. Now, some, there are those who advocate the view that in order for a mental state of this kind, a thought about your hand, a volition, to be conscious, it must be accompanied by a thought of this kind, called higher order consciousness views. They, there's, a kind, there's regress problems, there's issue, interesting issues to ask about such views. But it's very, very unlikely that a thought of this kind, the thought that you are reporting later, is actually the sense of consciousness that's crucial for the voluntary act requirement. So think about the person who squeezes the trigger and shoots somebody dead. What were they thinking about when they, when they squeezed the trigger? They, they probably, the, the squeezing of the trigger was in fact guided by a mental representation of that physical movement. So they were having a thought about the physical movement. But were they thinking, I am choosing to squeeze the trigger now? <laughs> no, they were thinking, I hate that guy's guts. I'm going to put a bullet through his head or something like that, right? So that is, in the sense of relevance to the voluntary act requirement, this mental state can be conscious even if it's not accompanied by a mental state of this kind. And so we shouldn't be concerned by the fact that there's a mental state, an earlier mental state, even if it is a mental state. There's actually even a question about that. But we shouldn't be concerned by the fact that there's a prior mental state. We shouldn't think that the mere fact of the existence of one, which we have a great trouble reporting, at the reporting when it occurred, that that fact undermines the kinds of consciousness which is relevant to the voluntary act requirement. So I should say, I think there are other ways of getting from that experiment to feeling that there's something out of whack. But this is one of the ways, and I just don't see it as successful. OK, let's consider a different kind of challenge to the voluntariness of behavior. So let's, whoops, what did I just do? There we go. So let's elaborate the intuitive picture of voluntary action a little more. One way we usually, a lot of people think of the role of the brain as a kind of bottleneck. So what happens is you have, a, you have quite complex past experience. Uh, your mother's nice to you or she isn't nice to you. You do this, you do that. It gets collected in the form of, it gets represented in the brain. And these representations in the brain, this definitely would not have this form of activity, but whatever, they respond to, they, they all lead you to make particular choices. And then those choices lead to your engaging in various forms of bodily motion. And the thought that there has to be causal connection between what you choose to do and what you do is a really crucial part of our ordinary conception of voluntary action. Doing something means causing it. It doesn't mean watching it happen. And it certainly doesn't mean watching it happen while thinking you're causing it. Now, here's a, here's a possibility. And in, in fact, this is, I think, to people who haven't been exposed to the kinds of information which leads people to think that this is what's going on, it seems just outlandish that anybody could think that this is really what's going on when you, when you act and think you are acting voluntarily. But we're going to see why people think that. They think, actually, brain states of various kinds, the kind that we ordinarily think lead us to make choices which then lead to action, actually cause action without the intervention of choice. So that the brain state past experience, however you want to think of it, past effects on your, on your current life have two effects. They cause you to move your body in a certain way. And they also cause you to make things that we would call, describe as choices. And further, you have the horrible feeling, horrible because it's an illusion, that those choice states are actually causing your bodily movements. 
when they aren't. Okay, I'll, this will be clear as we move forward. Let me give you an example. So this is this is an experiment from 2004. It's a Daniel Wegner experiment. Um, Wegner is getting something like this kind of causal diagram going on. Um, here's what he does. He has a, a subject. She faces a mirror. Behind her stands uh, probably postdoc who has her arms put through these so that when she is looking in the mirror, it looks like these are her hands, but they aren't. Notice also she's wearing headphones. So what happens is in the headphones, she hears things like clap twice, orders, okay? Do this kind of statements. And then, and then what's manipulated is what the hands do. So sometimes the hands clap twice, and then a second later she hears clap twice. Sometimes they say clap twice, and then immediately she claps twice. Sometimes there's kind of more like the sort of delay that you might think would happen if she was herself trying to obey the order. Clap twice, thought, I think I'll clap twice, clap, clap, OK? Now, not surprisingly, as you can imagine, if you were a subject in this experiment, um, she gets the distinct feeling that she moved her hands, moved those hands, the ones that she sees in the mirror, in the instances in which the timing is correct between the hearing the command and the performance of the physical motion. Okay? So she feels like she caused a motion, a motion of hands, that we know for sure she didn't cause, because who was it caused by? Caused by the person behind her, right? Actually, if Wagner's right, not even that person caused them, but that's a second <laughs> question. So the um <laughs> so so now that's, this is to say, if you go back to the little diagram on the bottom here, we've got, forget the brain picture here, we've got a manipulation which results in the causation of a bodily motion and results in her having the impulse or the representation, the thought, I'll move my hands. But we know for sure that the thought doesn't cause the motion, but she has the feeling that it did. Okay? Now, so this, experiments of this kind, and Wegner's created many of them, and they're extraordinarily clever, um, leads Wegner to draw this more complicated version of the little diagram that I had two slides back. He says, look, there's a lot of stuff over here, and it causes two things. It causes the thought, that's the willing or the volition, and it causes the action. And you've got this weird thing, which is that you feel as if you caused the action, but you didn't, thinks him, thinks Wagner, okay? Now, this is not a, this is not, this is psychology, um, but in fact, there's a, here's a recent experiment, a neuroscience experiment, that might make you think maybe Wegner's really right. Maybe it's not just in these weird situations in which you're manipulating people like that experiment. Maybe it's happening in other places too. So here's what they have. This is a Demerge uh, science paper from just two years ago. So they've got patients who are undergoing brain surgery. And so that means that their skulls are open and they're awake, which is another crucial thing about brain surgery. Um, what a marvelous opportunity. <laughs> so what they're doing is while the, uh, while the skulls are open, they are stimulating portions, small particular sites on the surface of the brain, and then they're seeing what's happening, okay? So you, you um, stimulate sites in the premotor cortex, and you can get patients to move their hand. Oh, also, I should add, they can't see their bodies during this motion. You, you stimulate portions of the premotor cortex and this patient will move his hand and you'll ask what happened and they like nothing. They don't know that they move their hands, okay? More interesting is that you, you stimulate places in the parietal cortex and the patient says, wow, I, I just formed the intention to move my hand. Then you increase the stimulation to that same site and the patient says, I just formed the intention to move my hand and then I moved my hand. But what happened? Nothing. They didn't move their hands. Okay? That is, what it looks like is you're getting, if you look back at Wegner's diagram here, what it looks like is through one form of stimulation, you're getting the causal path between here to here, from uh, what, uh, what Wegner labels as unconscious cause of action, to bodily movement. And through another causal path, you're getting the thought, the intention to move the hand, plus the appearance of having actually done so but without the movement of the hand, okay? So, gosh, does this mean that our volitions are not, in fact, causing our behavior? I mean, after all, 
what does volition consist in, probably, or what does in fact, or what does goes on any time you have one, is that you have certain kinds of brain activity. If the brain activity in the parietal that he's getting there is the brain activity that's involved in volition, then it seems like you can get that brain activity without getting the action and with the appearance that you caused it. But I don't think actually this experiment even shows this, as appealing as it might seem. So notice, if we're going to extend from the experimental situation to the ordinary situation, like that one, right? We have to think that the kind of thing that's going on in the experiment is the same kind of thing that's going on in the ordinary case. But here's one possibility. And I say, and I don't mean to suggest that this is decisive, but one possibility is, so, so here's, a, here's an ordinary phenomenon, which is you start to reach towards your, towards your pocket to get your keys. And then you realize, oh, my keys are already in my hand, and you stop. That is. What goes on there is that you start to engage in a bodily movement. Then you, rev, then you have feedback indicating that you actually are already engaged in the bodily movement that you were aiming to do. And the feedback stops the influence of your intention. You stop doing it. And we get, you get things like this actually all the time in, um, you find there's a, lot of, a lot of the neuroscience of pain has discovered loops of this kind, where feedback stops the causal influence. And here's an interesting fact, and this, there's a lot of evidence of this in monkey experiments, which is places in the parietal lobe in particular, in which you find activity that represents action, you also, next door, find neurons that regulate feedback that say, ah, you just succeeded in acting that way. OK? Stimulation, brain stimulation of the kind that Desmarges is doing is of an incredibly blunt tool. You're stimulating a huge number of neurons all at once, not one at a time at all. And so what that means is that you're probably stimulating both the neurons that tell you what to do and the neurons that tell you you just did it. And when you get the, iner when you get the information that says, I just did it, what do you do? You stop. So no surprise that we don't get the causation of bodily movement in these kinds of instances, OK? If that's right. A lot of empirical claims just went into the little argument that I gave you right there. And so this, uh, this uh, is an is a, is a experiment which I would put into the overstated category if you think that this shows that, in fact, our volitions are not causing our bodily movements. It doesn't show that. Here's a perfectly plausible explanation, which is supported by other empirical work, which defeats that story. OK. These two experiments that I've just showed you here, these are two of the most influential experiments in this field. They are two experiments which, almost, like anybody who's talking about kind of neuroscience of free will or neuroscience of criminal responsibility is, knows about these experiments. Um, let's move to the second part. Can neuroscience help us? So it's not, it's not going to undermine responsibility entirely, at least, you know, I haven't seen an experiment that did, that does. Could it nonetheless help? Will it make us, could it help us to make fewer errors? So here's my kind of guiding hypothesis. My, uh, I actually do, do competently know PowerPoint enough to put a box around things, but I think there was font substitution. But nonetheless, <laughs> so <laughs> the, um, there's, a, form of, there's a, a strand of neuroscience. It's sometimes called computational psychiatry, sometimes thought of as a kind of subdiscipline of neuroeconomics. I'm going to get, walk you through one experiment in this area. What I think this area, what I think it has the promise to do is to help us answer a particular kind of fascinating and difficult question which bears directly on criminal responsibility, but not by telling us that nobody has it or something like that, but rather helping us to make a particular kind of inference about normatively relevant facts that we are actually pretty bad at making. The inference is from people, a certain defendant, say, has a particular psychological disorder. So that person was or was not in a particular mental state that we, for independent reasons, think is of normative relevance. OK? Let me give you an example. Um, I choose this example because it's actually, it turns out it's a very, very common crime in Canada to uh, leave a child in a very hot car while you go and gamble inside a casino. OK? Um, I, I, I saw a study about this that had, had, had 20 cases of this in the, single, the same single parking lot in, a, in one year. Um, what's going on? Well, now, we distinguish in the criminal law between reckless and negligent actors, between those who, perform, who risk somebody else, risk a certain kind of harm to somebody while consciously aware 
that they're imposing those kinds of risks on the one hand, as opposed to those people who are not aware. They tell themselves a story that a reasonable person, we think, would not tell themselves as to why they're not risking such, such a harm to somebody else. So here's a question. You've got, so say you have a defendant who's left his child in a hot car while he gambled in the casino, and you want to know whether to classify this defendant as reckless or negligent. Do you need to know the time that he did this? Was he consciously aware of the risks that he was imposing on his child or not? Did he think, I'll just be in there 30 seconds, which you know, I do all the time with my kid in the car. But I'm right, I hope. But so the, did he tell himself a story like that? Or was he, in fact, think, eh, she'll probably be fine. I'm only going to be in there a couple hours. It's not that hot today, <laughs> right? In which case, we're going to classify him as a reckless actor. Well, so now we have a further question, which is, should we take into consideration the fact that he's a gambling addict? Does that even matter? Does that bear on the question? In, if it does bear on the question, what does it show? Do we think gambling addicts are more likely to be reckless than negligent? Less likely to be reckless than negligent? I mean, it's an empirical question. It could go either way, right? We don't know how to answer that question, not really. We make things up in criminal law contexts in order to answer it. And mostly, if it's addicts, we ignore the fact that they're addicts. OK. So let me give you an exp I'm going to talk through an experiment here. It does not speak to the question I just asked. What it does is it demonstrates a tool, which I think could be used to speak to that kind of question and others like it. So here's what they did. This is out of Brooke King Casas' lab. Um, so they've got, uh, they've recruited a bunch of borderline personality disorder patients and a bunch of people who do not have borderline personality disorder. And they are asking these people to play a game in the lab while they're doing what's called hyperscanning, which means that they're scanning both, both participants in the game while they play this game. Although, in fact, as we're going to see, the only thing that matters is the, for our purposes is the, the um, brain activity of the people on the, on the receipt side, on the trustee side. One person in the game is called the investor. The other person in the game is called the trustee. Here's how it works. The investor starts with 20 bucks and can choose how much of that to give to the mm -hmm. trustee. Can give anywhere from 0 to $20 to the trustee. When they give the money to the trustee, it triples. So if the investor chooses 0, the trustee gets 0. But if the investor chooses 20, then the trustee receives 60. Okay? And then the trustee, at will, can send money back in any amount that the trustee chooses. So the trustee can take the 60, say thank you very much, and walk. Or the trustee can send back 25, or whatever the trustee wants. Okay? And they play, this game, they play this game in an iterated fashion. They play it over and over again. So it's not a one-shot thing. If it were a one-shot thing, you could completely see why the trustee would just take whatever they got. Why would they send any money back? Like, they, don't need, they can say thank you after they leave the experiment. Right? So, but, but they're playing over and over again. And so the trustee has incentive to show himself or herself to be trustworthy by sending money back. Because that way, the investor will invest more. And you could see, right, they could really get into a great cycle where they both end up pretty rich after this game. Because if the investor puts the whole amount in and then the trustee sends back enough to have made it, made it worth his while, then they get into this great cycle and they're maximizing. Okay? On the other hand, if the, tr if the investor thinks that trustee's not trustworthy, I'm not sending him a penny, he's not going to send it back, then the, trustee, then the investor ought to just hold on to the money. All right? This is why it's called the trust game. So what they're trying to see is whether or not borderline personality disorder patients who have a lot of trouble with interpersonal relationships, this is like the major diagnostic feature about them, um, what happens when they play these games and what happens in their brains while they play this game. OK. So here's what happens. So whether you have, so we, we're, just so we're clear, we have a he healthy, healthy, and healthy BPD playing this game. Healthy, healthy, what happens is they start out pretty well. Later in the game, after they played more, more rounds, the, the amount of the investment that they're, that they're sending over drops. And what people, I think, have the sense is they, they don't want to, they, they have the sense like as you get closer to the end of the game, the trustee's going to bail, right? So you want to be sure that you don't kind of invest too much of what you've got here um, and give it up. So people, are, people drop. But in fact, I mean, and you look at the error bars here, in fact, they don't drop very much when they're playing another healthy person, OK? By contrast, if you're playing a borderline personality patient, and you have no idea that's who you're playing, you're just playing, it, they start out great, but then everything falls apart. And in the late rounds, the, the trust, the investor is like, 
screw this guy. He's not going to send me back a penny. I'm not going to give him anything. And they, they stopped sending over very much money. Okay? So now the, the experimenters here looked to see well, what, what was the difference in the behavior that resulted in this difference? What did the healthy trustees do that the borderline personality trustees did not do? And they identified what they called coaxing behavior. And it's, here's what they did. The healthy people, they see that the amount of the investment is going down. And so they say to themselves, gosh, that guy stop, isn't trusting me very much. I'd better kick in more. So they send back a larger percentage than they did on the previous rounds to kind of prove, hey, I'm in, we're in it together. I see that, right? They call that coaxing behavior. And it works. It's great. What happens is you coax, and then the trustee, or then the investor, responds to the coaxing and sends back more money. And they, they manage to keep trust going, and they get a lot of big investments towards the end. Okay? The borderline personality disorder patients, they just don't coax. Like, that guy's not trusting me, I guess. Uh, screw him. They just don't send back more money to show themselves to be trustworthy. Now, why? What is it about the borderline personality disorder patients? What is it about their psychology which leads them not to coax? Here are two possible explanations. The first is the borderline personality trustee <coughs> notices, right? They see. That guy doesn't trust me anymore. But they, they don't know how to fix it. So they're kind of hapless, right? They recognize fully that they're not being trusted. But they, they just don't know how to send signals back in a way which is going to help the other person to trust them. That's one possibility. The second explanation is they don't even notice that they're not trusted. You get the same behavior either way. Either way, you would explain why they didn't coax either because they don't notice or because they notice but don't know how to respond. So what should you say? Which of these explanations is better? You, if, you, if you cared only in this instance about the behavioral data, you would end right there. We don't know which explanation is right based on this data alone. Maybe we could do further behavioral experiments that would figure it out. But we don't know just based on this. Now the neural data, however, is different. No nice, pretty brain picture here, I'm afraid. but. Here's what happens when healthy, healthy. This First, we're looking at the neural response on receipt of the investor's investment. So we're looking at, you, you're the trustee. You get the money. And now you see how much it is. And we're looking at your brain while you get that money. I say we to mean the collective we, because I had nothing to do with this experiment. But the, and what you find is that if it looks like you weren't trusted much, the investment was like zero, you get this really, you get a big insular response. Insula doesn't really matter where it is, but you get a big insula response. The more of the, the greater the investment, because remember the investment signals how much you're trusted, the greater the investment, the lesser the insula response in a pretty systematic pattern here. Let me say something about this before I talk about the, the alternative graph. Who, we, here's what you should not say. What you should not say is, ah, what we've discovered here is that the insula is the area that's involved in norm violation recognition, or something like that. Or even the insular activity is what underlies the thought, that guy doesn't trust me. We should not say that. We have no idea what physiological stuff is going on when you have those thoughts exactly. And, we, and for all we know, the best way to characterize what the neural state is that's underlying such a thought would be to look at the whole brain, not just one part of it, as is thought to be the case in many areas in cognitive neuroscience. But here's what we do know, or it seems plausible anyway. If you're having the thought, that guy doesn't trust me, you're likely to represent a particular piece of information in your brain, namely the difference between what he would do if he trusted me and what he's in fact doing. It would be very plausible to think that that piece of information would be relevant, because that would tell you how much he doesn't trust me. What this is showing is that the insula is representing that piece of information. It's carrying that information, the, the signal in the insula. We don't know what it does with it. We don't know where, that's, where that information goes. We don't know what role it plays in conscious experience. We don't know anything like that at all. All we know is that the brain is representing that piece of information and using it. Contrast this with the borderline personality disorder patient, where you don't get 
they, they can't, the, the experimenters in this case cannot find any signal in the brain which is correlating in a clear way with this piece of information which is correlating very clearly in the healthy, in the healthy trustees. Okay, that section of the insula is just varying all over the place. And they can't find the signal anywhere else. That doesn't mean that there isn't such a signal. Maybe it's there. Maybe it's too weak to, to detect. There's a lot of possibilities. But in any event, it's not there in the same way in which it is in healthy people. Okay? Now, what's the best explanation for that? One possible explanation is the borderline personality disorder patients aren't having the thought that I'm, I'm not being trusted. And so they don't need to represent the piece of information, namely how much am I not trusted, which seems a crucial part of such a thought. It's not the only explanation of the neural data, but it's a highly suggestive one. So what just happened? We had, a dis we had two psychological explanations. We couldn't distinguish between them on the basis of the behavioral data that we had. But one of them looks more plausible given the neural data. OK? Now, here's yet another one. This is, I think, in some ways more fascinating, which is that now you look at what's going on in the brain when the trustee returns the money. And here, so if they return nothing at all, people who return nothing at all have this big insular response. They're like, I'm violating a norm. <laughs> I'm showing myself not to be trustworthy. That is, if you had the thought, that is, again would be how untrustworthy are you showing yourself to be? And that would be a crucial piece of information. And it looks like their brains are calculating that information. But interestingly, so are the borderline personality disorder patients. So what's weird, right? They seem to notice, they seem not to notice, you might think, when other people are behaving in a way which they're not, they're not noticing any way what other people are thinking of them. But they certainly notice what they are showing to others in, through their conduct. That's a very interesting result. And it looks like it's a result that you're finding out of the neural data. Now, does any of this show us anything about mens rea? Absolutely not. Okay? Nothing here on the psychological states that we appeal to was of crucial importance to responsibility. It just wasn't. But we recognize that mental state is crucial to responsibility. And it looks like neural tools might be useful for determining which mental state a particular person is in when that's underdetermined by his behavior. As in the case of our imagined gambling addict, we, just, we don't know from what he did whether or not he was reckless or negligent, for instance. That suggests that you ought to be able to design studies with the following structure. You put people in the lab in circumstances in which they're either in a mental state of one type or another. And then you try to see, can I decide which mental state they're in on the basis of neural activity alone? Or neural activity in conjunction with behavioral? And then you say, now let's compare how commonly they're in that one mental state if they're an addict in comparison to those who aren't an addict. Or pick your favorite PTSD. This might be another one for understanding non-intentional harming and what kinds of mental state people are in when they unintentionally harm. OK, whoops, <laughs> I just got a text. I won't answer that now. <laughs> um, so let me just give you an example of the kind of task that um, I'm playing around with, or rather with neuroscientific collaborators and playing around with. Although this is really, I mean, this is like, do we have an experiment? No, we're messing around. Um, will we get an experiment? I hope so. Imagine the following kind of choice. You're going to make the following choice a um, hundred times in the lab. And at the end of the experiment, we're going to randomly choose one of them. And you're going to get the outcome of that experiment, um, get the outcome of that choice. So here's what you're going to choose between. You're going to choose between either nothing for you and nothing for some hapless graduate student. Or on the alternative, you're going to get you know, something that's nice, an iPad. But we're going to flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, we're going to give that guy an electric shock. And you're going to have to watch, OK? You're going to make this choice 100 times. And we're going to be scanning your brain while you do that. So here's a question, right? The person who's reckless, that person, when they, when they choose the high payoff for themselves and the risk for somebody else, is consciously aware of the risk for the other person. The negligent agent, by contrast, is somehow putting it out of their mind that there's a risk for the other person. Putting it out of their mind. So now we have a pair of thoughts. 
the reckless thought, the negligent thought, can we distinguish those based on neural data? And then if we could, could we then find out whether or not people with particular psychological disorders who are given this kind of choice to make fall into one category rather than the other, more likely? Or maybe it's a combination of things, not just the, dis not just the presence of this, the disorder, but the presence of the disorder together with various environmental cues. So does the heroin addict who's in a car with somebody who's shooting heroin, so in the presence of drug cues, is that person consciously aware of the risks that they're imposing on other people when they drive recklessly or drive in a strict crazy way or something like that, or not? So that is, this is, again, something which you could reproduce in the lab. You, you can place people in situations in which they're in the presence of drug cues. And you can see whether or not, if you had a way of distinguishing between the mental their mental states in the, in the lab situation, you could then determine whether or not that combination of factors, the drug being a drug addict together with the presence of drug cues, has an effect on, on mental state and what effect it has. Okay? This is the kind of study that I think needs to be done. So summary, is neuroscience going to show us that we ought never to be assigning criminal responsibility? I mean, almost surely not. It's not going to show us that across the board we lack some particular property which we take to be necessary for justified responsibility assignments. <coughs> is it going to help us to do it better? Is it going to help us to make more accurate assessments of whether or not particular people are criminally responsible? I, I think it might. But in order to do it, you have to reproduce the normatively relevant properties in the lab. Um, when is that going to happen? I don't know. But it's something I'm working on. And I end with a sunset, because sunsets are pretty. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much.